when the gospel began to be preached, it didn't start with a whimper. It wasn't like a still, small voice. When God spoke through the gospel of Jesus Christ, it thundered. Amen. You know, it's kind of like when the temple was dedicated by Solomon. Solomon's temple, they made all these sacrifices. And then Solomon prayed this awesome prayer. And fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And then a cloud came in. This cloud of glory came in so that the priests couldn't even minister. Well, this is what it was like in the day of Pentecost and following. There was a time of great glory. But in this glory, you see, the priests were made compatible with glory, and they were able to minister. God was working miracles. God was doing great things among the people. The apostles preaching the gospel, this was confirmed by God, miraculously. This was God's stamp of approval on the temple when he sent the cloud of glory in. It was his stamp of approval. And God gave his stamp of approval to the gospel in these early days. Think about what was happening the, the apostles were preaching the gospel and working miracles at Jerusalem. It says that gr with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. It was such a sacred and holy time that when Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Ghost, God killed them. I wonder if this, this is why they started the practice of having the cemetery right next to the church building. Have you seen that? But this was a sacred time. Great fear, it said that in Acts chapter 5, great fear came upon all the church. By the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. It said that believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women. They brought forth sick folk and laid them in the streets so that the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow them. Something was happening. God was giving his stamp of approval to the gospel. It said also that a multitude came out of the cities round about Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits. The whole city was swamped with people. Boy, the traffic in Jerusalem must have been something. Multitudes of people were all descending upon Jerusalem. And you know what it says? And it says, they were healed, every one. Every one. Didn't matter what sickness they had, didn't matter what unclean spirit they had, everyone came to Jerusalem and they were healed. It was like an explosion of heavenly activity. Really, brethren, it was a manifestation of God's power. Brother Boyce talked about power. Boy, you talk about power. Jesus dropped a bomb on this world. Only it didn't take men's lives. It gave men life. God gave the gospel through Jesus Christ. And then it says the high priest rose up and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. And God said, I can't have my apostles sitting in the prison. They've got work to do. So he sent an angel. The angel came by night, opened the doors of the prison, brought them forth and said, go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. It was life that he was preaching. The gospel is all about life. Amen. He said, go and preach life. 
Jesus Christ brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. This summarizes what the gospel is all about. It's about life. If you haven't been made alive in Christ, you've lost everything. You just don't have anything. Amen. The gospel is about life, and it is not primarily about this life. The gospel is about eternal life. It does affect this life. But it is not primarily about this life. Jesus brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Amen. Doesn't that have a good sound to it? Yes. See, life is the message that we take to the world. We are like blameless and harmless sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world holding forth the word of life. You're holding forth the word of life and whoever wants life can have it. We're holding it forth. Well, because of Adam's sin, death passed upon all men. Man is born, he grows, and he dies. That's life in this world. And uh, someone who is wise about these things said, vanity of vanities. He looked at this life, Solomon had a unique position. God gave him all the resources to be able to have anything this world had to offer. God gave him the position and the resources to experience the best that life had, and Solomon's conclusion is vanity of vanities. All is vanity. What profit hath the man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? That's what he said. What's the prophet? Solomon's wisdom made him to see the vanity of life under the sun and raise questions for mankind to ponder. Do you see that? Ecclesiastes is there to make us ask these questions, to think about this. What is life all about? Is this really all there is? Is, is this, is there no purpose to life? Are we just like the beasts? I think that people in general have stopped asking this question. What is life about? Satan has so deceived people that as soon as they might start thinking about what's the purpose, why am I here? He puts some entertainment in there quickly distracting them with entertainment yeah. to movies, to their phone. People live their lives in front of a screen and between some headphones, just constantly pumping in distraction after distraction after distraction, and people do not come to realize vanity of vanities. There's got to be something more. You might have some good things in life and they quickly fade and you quick, did anyone testify that you quickly get old? And then you lose the ability to enjoy everything and then you lose everything and then you die. Solomon said, I've seen all the works that are done under the sun and behold all is vanity and vexation of spirit. He said, therefore, I hated life. Because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me, for all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Yea, I hated all my labor, which I had taken under the sun, because I should leave it unto the man that shall be after me, and who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. So he's... God gave us, without giving Solomon the answer, God gave us this question. Why are we here? Is there a higher purpose? 
Well, we had men of faith. Men of faith lived by faith, and it says that they, like David, he slept with his fathers. So after this life, he slept with his fathers. Solomon, his son, slept with his fathers. Jeroboam, Rehoboam, Abijam, it just goes on. It says that they slept with their fathers. But Abraham, Abraham, brethren, Stephen preaching said that God gave Abraham no inheritance in it, no not such as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it him for a possession and to his seed after him when as yet he had no child. So God promised him the land and he didn't give him any of the land. But brethren, and like Jacob also, remember he met Pharaoh, he said, few and evil have been the days of the years of my pilgrimage. Few and evil. This life, brethren, if we had hope in this life only, we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But brethren, Hebrews tells us something that Abraham wanted. He saw something beyond this land where he didn't have possessions. It says in Hebrews eleven thirteen, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. In other words, he said, I don't want my inheritance here. I'm looking for a city which hath foundations. Abraham was looking for the resurrection of the dead and the inheritance that God had for him. They that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. He was seeking a country. He didn't get it here, but he wasn't looking for it here. He said, I walked up and down in it, but uh, no foundations here. No foundations here, brethren. We're looking for one that's to come. They desire a better country, it says, that is, and heavenly. It's revealed here. Abraham and those who walked by faith were looking for a heavenly country, not one in this life. See, their faith reached beyond the grave and laid hold of eternal life. Praise God. But if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept? For since by Adam came death, by, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Jesus brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. The appearing of Jesus on the earth was manifesting God's own purpose and grace that was given us before the world began. And he abolished death. Did you know that? Jesus abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So in order to bring life and immortality to light, first let's see this, that he abolished death. Amen. Hosea 13, 14, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O oh, death, I will be thy plagues. O oh, grave, I will be thy destruction. Amen. Amen. Thou hast ascended up on high. Thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts for men. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. He abolished death. Jesus was offering something that was a life that couldn't be touched by physical death. Oh, praise God. So, when this has been made light, when we've, we've come to see that Christ has abolished death, then our whole perspective on death has changed. Amen. 
it actually has a victorious tone to it. So, slept with our fathers becomes, I'm going to depart and be with Christ. Amen. See, he led captivity captive. Now death has no more power. Paul even said, I'm a straight, in a strait betwixt two. Having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. This is how the apostle talks about death. This is how the gospel opens up that death has been destroyed. Paul also said, we are confident, we are willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Aren't you, brethren? Amen. Paul said, I'm ready to be offered in the time of my departure is at hand. It's like, it's like the train is coming up. It's the time of my departure. He said, to, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And even Peter, he said, knowing that I must shortly put off this, my tabernacle. So you, your body, which is the only part that's going to die, and it's just like a tent. And as you get older, you find it gives you more and more trouble. And so you just, you're going to just put it off someday. And then you're going to be free. Amen. So Christ partook of flesh and blood, so that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Jesus destroyed the devil that had the power of death. And then it says, and to deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. We're set free from being afraid of death because the gospel has brought it to light. The gospel has opened up that it is just departing and being with Christ. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light, and they that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. So, brethren, the gospel opened up the mystery of eternal life. He brought life and immortality to light. So what... What specifically did he bring to light about eternal life? That did he bring to light that it actually exists? Actually, the old covenant writings spoke about life going on without end after life is over. The Old Testament talked a lot about this. There was awareness of life after death. Let me just remind you of a few Job said, and though after my skin worms destroyed this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself and not another. David said, as for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. He knew about resurrection of the dead. And Isaiah said, Thy dead men shall live together with my dead body. They shall arise, awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust, for thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. They knew that the earth was going to cast out the dead. Even in Jesus' day, there was a general understanding of a resurrection, and the, or the Sadducees were a little confused about it. But Jesus said, if you knew the scriptures or the power of God, you would know there is a resurrection of the dead. Paul, even in his defense, he said before them, I have hope toward God, as they also allow that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. So there was an understanding that there is eternal life, but it wasn't very clear. It was a little bit cloudy. And the way to obtain eternal life wasn't clear. So then the law was given. This law proposed to offer life. Galatians 3, 12 sums it up. It says, the man that doeth them shall live in them. 
but the commandment which was ordained to life we found to be unto death. So the law said, you, you want to live? Do this. And we found it to be unto death. The commandment came, sin revived, and I died. One even came to Jesus and said, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So the gospel opens up the way to eternal life. It is through Jesus, Amen. right? This is the way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So eternal life, going out, living, being raised from the dead, and living forever. This was understood, but no one imagined that life would be given to us in this world. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for them that waiteth for him. God was going to give eternal life to men who are alive on the earth. Amen. Jesus, when he came, he preached the gospel and the subject was life. He said in John 17, as thou hast given him power over flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is the sum. This is the essence of it. He said, and this is eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Amen. That is eternal life. And God was going to give it to men on the earth. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Jesus had the power to give life. And he gave, he gave his sheep eternal life. Amen. He gave us eternal life. And Simon Peter recognized, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Amen. So think with me about the present possession of eternal life. Not just out there in the future, but God gave us life now Amen. through Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus said in John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. You have it now. Amen. And shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Amen. We have been raised, we have a spiritual resurrection. We were dead in transgressions and sins and now we've been made alive. Amen. And 1 John 3, 14 says, we know that we have passed from death unto life. Amen. So all those who have been born again in Christ Jesus are now alive. They're alive, Amen. responsive to God, aware of God and his purpose, Amen. alive to him. The, spirit, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Amen. So this is the nature of this life. Adam's sin brought immediate spiritual death, right? Right? He said, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And it started the clock ticking toward his physical death. Christ's righteousness imputed to us gives immediate, immediate spiritual life and, this, and starts the clock ticking toward our receiving a new incorruptible body. Amen. So that's how it is. Oh, thank you, sister. One day, my voice is going to be able to keep up with my spirit. 
A physical death precedes a physical resurrection. And a spiritual death precedes a spiritual resurrection. Well, it says that Jesus brought it to light so that we, it can be seen. He brought it to light on display for anyone to see. If anyone wants to know what life is, they can see. But the preaching of the gospel is not just to teach us about life. It is God's means of imparting life. It is the power of God unto salvation. The preaching of the gospel gives life to people. That's how he does it. Let me remind you of Ezekiel 37. There was a valley of dry bones. And God was going to give life to those bones, and so he told Ezekiel to prophesy. Yeah. Prophesy to the bones. And say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. That's the message of the gospel. Jesus said the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. God can just say, to, while we're in our blood, he can say live. The message of the gospel does that. It imparts life to us. So this is God's way of giving life. Hear and live. Incline your ear and come unto me here and your soul shall live. This is the way God gives life is by hearing the gospel. They that hear shall live. Like Lazarus coming forth, we hear his voice and live. That's the power of the gospel. It's like Moses lifted up that serpent in the wilderness. Whoever looked upon it lived. And it's like those waters in Ezekiel. Remember the river came out from under the throne and everywhere the waters touched, it was, it was healed. The waters went out and healed. Well, wherever the gospel goes, except for the marshy places. Now, that's, that's where people don't believe it. But wherever it is believed, those waters touch and cleanse and give life. And then he said, It shall come to pass that the fishers shall stand upon it and shall be a place to spread forth nets. Their fish shall be according to their kinds as the fish of the great sea, exceeding many. And the gospel was preached and exceeding many, 3,000 at one time and then 5,000 at another and then multitudes upon multitudes heard the gospel and came to life and he sent out fishers of men to collect those. <laughs> Where the gospel is preached, the waters are healed and the fishers catch exceeding many. Amen. We're actually begotten by the gospel. It says in 1 Corinthians 4, 15, I have begotten you through the gospel. That's how we're made alive. We're born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. Amen. So the gospel brought all this to light that Jesus was bringing eternal life to us now. See, and uh, we have this eternal life and this eternal life is just going to go on into eternity. You know, we, we will never die. This body will just put it off and our eternal life will continue on. Life and immortality have been brought to light. So I like to look for life. I like to look around, just sometimes you throw out a little bait, you're fishing for men and you throw out a little bait and you see if they give you a blank stare or, or if they start to light up. Then you see there's life there. See, so yeah, well, I think we ought to take our vital signs. There's signs of life. And there are signs of death. 
scientists are looking for life on Mars and they haven't found it on Earth yet. <laughs> There's life all around us if you can see it. I see it in brethren. One was saying to me, we've been doing some real soul searching. God's working in their hearts. God's working in their life. They're alive to God. This is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son of God hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. And he said, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. So what are the signs of eternal life? There's the love of the brethren. I'm just going to quickly go through these. But love of the brethren, love of the truth. When you, you share scripture with someone and they light up. There's life there. Love of the world to come, how about that? So, we're, brethren, we're essentially otherworldly. We belong to the world to come. Our life is there. That's where our her inheritance is. That's where our Savior is. That's where our heart is. So we cannot be caught up in this world. We can't love this world. But I want you to examine yourself today. I'm asking you to examine where, what's the level of your life? I've been praying for you since I began preparing for this message. And for myself, where are we? Do you see life in yourself? This is a, this is a cause of great confidence and rejoicing when we see it. But sometimes, brethren, we need to examine ourselves. Are your conversations, say in your family, are your conversations shaped by what's in the news? So, I mean, is the news dictating the subject of conversation? Is the news directing the subject of your preaching? This is this world. This world is passing away. We've got eternal life. Our heart and our conversation must be there. No man that warth entangleth himself in the affairs of this life. Amen. See, eternal life is incompatible with this world. Jesus even said, whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Yes. You, you can't have both. Whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. And Jesus gives us eternal life and immortality. And we will go on forever and ever. Amen. World without end. Yes. So I want us to examine ourselves, brethren. There are three types of people. There are those who are alive to God, those who are dead, and those who are sleeping. It is possible to be alive and to be asleep. If that's you today, I want you to wake up. Amen. Awake thou that sleepest and rise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light, Amen. knowing that it is, knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Your eternal life has to be fed just like your physical life. And so it's as simple as this. Are, who are you feeding? Your spiritual life is, is fading and squandering and you're sleeping and you wonder why you've been feeding yourself with this world and the cares of this life and everything else is choking out the Word of God. But you feed yourself with the Word of God. Get a good diet of it. Amen. Feed yourself with the brethren. 
and the fellowship and prayer. And it's like the manna. It's the manna. It, we need it. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Amen. But I encourage you, brethren. We are, we are shining forth as lights in the world Amen. as we hold forth the word of life. Be alive. Be awake. Be alert. There's battle to do. There are victories to be won. And Jesus Christ has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel.